Hello everyone, my name's Tim. You're watching Lost in Law. Today, we're going to be covering the Keegstra case. The case of an Alberta high school teacher charged with willfully promoting hatred against an identifiable group. So, in Canada, we don't have the First Amendment, the right to free speech. We have the right to freedom of expression as guaranteed by Section 2 in our Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Now, freedom of expression is not the same as freedom of speech. And we're going to look at some of the built-in limits to our freedom of expression. To do that, we're going to look at a Supreme Court case, which split our court 5-4. So it was, um, it was a very controversial case, and it was not clear-cut as to which way was the proper way to rule. So we'll go through a little bit of the background here. Once again, I'm using my trusty Canley tool. So the accused, in this case, an Alberta high school teacher, is charged under Section 319 sub 2 of the Criminal Code with willfully promoting hatred against an identifiable group by communicating anti-Semitic statements to his students. So Keekstra was teaching Holocaust denial as part of his high school, uh, his high school course. What's interesting, too, is that he was allowed to do this for well over a decade. I think he was charged in... I, f I forget when he was actually charged, what year he was charged, but apparently he started with the school in the 70s and was charged in uh, the early 80s. So th this has been going on for quite some time. Now, of course, 82 was the introduction of our brand new shiny Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And then this course, which was ruled on in 1990. There was also in 1984, there was the so-called Oaks test, which was created. And that, the Oaks test is how you determine whether or not a freedom can be limited in our charter. So we'll go into all that in just a second, but let's go through the facts of the case. Um... He's charged under the criminal code, and we'll actually have a look at what that section of the criminal code is. So it's willful pr promotion of hatred. Every person, or well, everyone who, by communicating statements other than in private conversation, promotes hatred against any identifiable group is guilty of, and then this here, the uh, indictable versus summary is just the difference between felony and misdemeanor in Canada. Uh, it's not exactly a one to one difference. There's a uh, it, it's not exactly the same as the difference between misdemeanor and felony, but just in, in keeping in mind, uh, our summary conviction would be your misdemeanor in the US and indictable offenses would be what are considered our felony offenses, more serious offenses. Uh, this section here was not added until after. This was um, not this is a current version of Canada's criminal code, not the one as it existed in 1984. So there are some important words in here that I want people to pay attention to. Willfully is a very important word. You can't be reckless when you promote hatred. This law will not catch you. You have to have understood and appreciated the consequences of what you were doing and fully intended their outcome. So you can't be reckless. Recklessness is seeing a risk and proceeding despite the risk, even though perhaps the end result was not your intention, that's being reckless. In this case, uh, we require that you are willfully promoting hatred in that it was your intent by distributing the material that you were going to communicate the statements with which, uh, of which are in question. It also makes this uh, exception for outside of private conversation. Or in private. It, the exception is for in private conversation. So as you can see, this law is actually very narrowly tailored. There's not a lot of people it will catch accidentally. In fact, it only catches the most egregious, I would argue, of the people perpetuating hatred against an identifiable group. It's only going to catch the most serious of which uh, people who are, you know, I'm going to pass out pamphlets and I know they're hateful and I'm fully intending that people will read them and agree with my hateful statements. That's the kind of person it's trying to catch. Now, there are built-in defenses as well. 
So if the statement was true, not a crime. You can also, there's these exceptions for uh, relevant debate or for perhaps pointing out, um, you know, quote, uh, quoting in order to draw attention to say, hey, we should get rid of this uh, post. Um, I mean, these defenses make sure that there's no, there's no question of whether possessing hatred, uh, per, uh, possessing a hateful brochure is a problem. It's not. You actually have to be willfully promoting it. So, um, yeah, and so that is our, that's our section 319, uh, sub two, this one here. This is our, uh, 319 sub one is our kind of, you know, hate speech law. Now, Keegstra, let's go back a second. Keegstra is challenging the validity of 319.2 against the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. So specifically, it's 2B, freedom of thought, belief, opinion, and expression, including freedom of the press. Most Americans will recognize this kind of language. That's, your, uh, that's the language under your First Amendment. We have very similar language, but not the same. Now, we have a built-in limiter in the Charter, and this is Section 1. So, if you have a law that violates Section 2B, of which, you know, uh, the section of the Criminal Code, 319 sub 2, absolutely violates your freedom of speech, or your freedom of expression. 100% it does. The court agreed with that. In fact, um... When Keegstra challenged, when he appealed his case to the Alberta Court of Appeal, they agreed with him. They said, no, 319 sub 2 clearly violates the charter against freedom of expression. So it's uh, null and void. We have to strike down the law. Of course, this goes up to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court had their brand new shiny Oaks test, which was in 1984. And the Oaks test is how you apply section one against a violation of another section. So section one guarantees the rights and freedoms set out subject only to such reasonable limits prescribed by law as can be demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society. So the Oaks test put uh, was the Supreme court putting on paper, what test you would have to run in order to ensure that your law could survive a charter challenge. This built-in limitation is actually quite a high threshold because we hold, in Canada, we hold to be expression as one of our most fundamental freedoms, right? You see it here joined with freedom of conscience and religion, freedom of assembly, freedom of association. These are the rights that we can hold most dear, consider our most important. So to override them, to violate them, requires something that you can justify in a free and democratic society. Now, the Charter also can, contains all of our other rights, too. The right to free and fair elections, the right to livelihood, the right to uh, mobility, the right to life, liberty, and security of person, uh, unreasonable search and seizure, cruel and unusual punishment, um, this is our self-crimination, right? So a lot of people would recognize that as pleading the fifth in the U.S. So, but we'll come back up to here. What saved this law, and we'll just go back. So what saved this law was its narrow wording capturing only the uh, most egregious violators, the most egregious purveyors of hate. Because in order to, uh, well, let's let's go have a look at the Oaks test before I go any further. Um, I believe it's in here somewhere. I can pull it up. If I can't find it. There should be. Yep, that's, that's the one. R.V. Oaks, you can see. Oh, my, my bad. It was decided in 86, not 84. 
Um, the Oaks test. Okay, so we're going to start reading from this paragraph here. So this, of course, this is the prior Supreme Court ruling in R.V. Oaks, and this is what established the Oaks test. To, so two central criteria must be satisfied in order to establish the reasonable limit as de demonstrably justified in a free de democratic society. First, the objective to be served by measures limiting a charter right must be sufficiently important to warrant overriding a constitutionally protected right or freedom. The standard must be high to ensure that trivial objectives or those this discordant with the principles of a free and democratic society do not gain protection. So, of course, when we're talking about hate speech, we don't want to protect hate speech with Section 2B of our charter. At a minimum, an objective must relate to societal concerns which are pressing and substantial before it can be characterized as sufficiently important. Second, the party invoking Section 1 must show the means to be reasonably and demonstrably justified. This involves a form of proportion. Excuse me. This involves a form of proportionality test involving three important components. This here, this is the Oaks test, the proportionality test. To begin, the measures must be fair and not arbitrary. So a good example of an arbitrary measure would be uh, we're going to ban yellow shirts in order to combat hate speech. That is an arbitrary measure and it would never survive this section one test. It would therefore be struck down as unconstitutional. Carefully designed to achieve the objective in question and rationally connected to that objective. In this case, it is carefully crafted to achieve the objective of preventing hate speech. It is rationally connected to the objective of preventing hate speech. And in, uh, one would argue that it uh, very rarely uh, would catch someone who is afoul of the law, but not engaging in hate speech. Mainly, and it's mainly because of those uh, built-in uh, defenses and protections that I uh, pointed out earlier. Uh, if the law was not as ca caref carefully crafted, perhaps uh, you could be reckless in promoting hatred. Then perhaps the Supreme Court would have ruled differently. Because uh, it would have it would have determined that it was not carefully designed to achieve the objective. In addition, the means should impair the right in question as little as possible. What we don't want to do is restrict the rights of people who are not committing crimes. And again, the very narrow language of section uh, yeah section three nineteen sub two. It's very narrowly tailored. So it's not going to, uh, it has very little chance of sweeping up people who are not, um, uh, who are, who are not committing a crime, but still doing something morally reprehensible. Because you can get away with a lot actually in Canada for what you say. Um, hate speech has a very, very, um, it has a very specific definition and very few people actually get charged under it. Lastly, there must be proportionality between the effects limiting the measure and the objective. The more severe the deleterious effects of the measure, the more important the objective must be. So if we go back to Oaks, or sorry, this is Oaks. So Oaks was a drug trafficking uh, case, but we have the Oaks test. This whole paragraph becomes the Oaks test. So let's go back and see how they applied the Oaks test. And you'll see here that these are the justices that actually disagreed with that uh, 319 was constitutional. Remember, this was a split 5-4 court. I think 5-4. Or was it 4? It might have been 4-3. Yeah, because uh, not all Supreme Court judges hear every case in Canada. But um, those who dissented 
said that to be is such a strong right that it must have maximum protection within our law. And so therefore laws that limit speech are unconstitutional. So the judges who uh, agreed that in the majority that section 319 is constitutional and should remain in our laws, they accepted the argument that the criminal code provision 319 sub 2 does not unduly impair freedom of expression. It is not overly broad or vague. And in fact, as I had pointed out, there are definitional limits which act as safeguards to ensure that it will only capture expressive activity as openly hostile to Parliament's objective, which is uh, reducing hate speech. Of course, the Supreme Court then goes into the word willfully, as I explained earlier. So, of course, the uh, parliamentary objective is talked about here. To reduce harm caused by hate propaganda. To recognize that um, allowing it to exist can create racial and ethnic tensions and religious tensions, perhaps even violence within this country. There is substantial harm that can flow from allowing hate propaganda. So the court has laid out this foundation and then said that 319 sub 2 is a violation of 2B, but it is saved by section 1 of the charter because it is uh, a reasonable limit that can be justified in a free and democratic society. So I hope that you guys learned a little bit about how Canada protects freedom of expression and the limits of those protections. Suffering through the misfortune of others, or in this case, uh, the misfortune of uh, Mr. Keegstra. I don't know where he is now. I, I would imagine he's still alive, but... Uh, I don't know if he's still in jail or if he's out, if he's been released or what he's doing. Um, if he is released, it's probably a very good idea for him to just keep his head down, not draw attention to himself, because uh, this this case is very central in learning about the Constitution in Canada, especially the Charter. Um, this case was quite controversial at the time. Um, that was our former Supreme Court Chief Justice, Beverly McLaughlin who dissented in the Keekstra case and said that the Section 2B protection is so powerful it overrides the uh, parliamentary objective of reducing hate speech. So uh, the, you'll notice a mention of 11D as well, which is the presumption of innocence. Um, the court rejected those arguments. They're, I'm not really going to go into them in this video, but uh, perhaps we'll come back to it someday. Um, but... I do hope that you found this video informative, interesting. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments below. I'll try to answer them as best I can. Uh, next week, what am I working on? Well, yeah, also, I have been away for a while because law school has really been, uh, really been kicking my butt. And we're working real hard in it. But we're going into exam time, which means I get to procrastinate by filming videos like this one. And if my professors are watching, I'm only joking. I kid. But I'm hoping that I can get more frequent content out. So I'm going to film another video today and hopefully release that soon. We're going to be talking about a concept that my American audience will also um, recognize. And that is the concept of willful blindness. So willful blindness is dealt with here in Canada in addition to the Ninth Circuit in the United States. And it is a principle that a lot of crimes, in order to be convicted of a crime, you had to have known you were committing a crime. You had to have known that what you were doing was criminal and that the outcome was likely to be a criminal act. There are some crimes, however, you can be convicted of and not even know you had done it. Drug possession is one of them. 
and especially drug trafficking. And there's a lot of cases of people trying to sneak drugs over the international boundary. And then they say, well, I didn't know it was drugs, so therefore I didn't commit a crime. Now, that is a bit of a problem. The way that we look at mens rea in crimes, right, the guilty mind, you can't be guilty of a crime you didn't know you were committing. But what happens when you act in such a way that you have abandoned all reasonable well uh, let's not use reasonable let's not let's not use that kind of language let's say you're handed a bag and you're told not to look in the bag just drive the bag over to bro- the border and then meet my friend and he'll pick the bag up from you so you get stopped at the border the bag gets searched and it turns out it's a bunch of marijuana And importing marijuana over the international boundary with a license is a crime. And you're in possession of it, therefore you committed the crime. But you tell the officer, well, I was just given the bag. I I didn't, he told me not to look in it, so I didn't look in it. What part of law is going to apply when the judge says that, well, under those circumstances, you should have looked in the bag. You should have known you should have pursued a line of further inquiry and you chose not to do so because you figured knowing the truth would get you in trouble. So you just blatantly ignored all suspicions. We would call that being willfully blind. And for a crime that requires a knowledge component, willful blindness serves as the substitute to actual knowledge. It's an interesting video topic. I hope to get into detail a lot more about how we treat willful blindness in both of our legal systems. Until next time, everyone. Stay frosty.